nobody forces me to do anything I don't want to do. I retired. You retired. You retired. Yes. Why did you feel like it was time? Well, um, it becomes very frustrating when um, there's multiple shootings, um, you have officers that are continuing to leave the department, um, and you know, okay, what you can do when you're hold, right? Mm -hmm. When you have all the pieces in place, you know what you're capable of doing. And you also know what you're capable of not doing when you don't have all the pieces. And um, I, I came to the point that um, there's very little I can do at this point to impact gun violence. Gun violence in Norfolk has been historical. Um, this isn't something that's just happened since the pandemic. It's, it's been here for decades. Um, and until we address poverty, and I don't care where it is, whether it's Detroit, Cleveland, or any of those areas uh, where there's an urban setting with poverty, we're going to continue to have these conversations. That, that's, that's the only thing that will fix this. Um, programs are great, right? Thoughts and prayers are great. We need those. But until we address uh, the generational, um, systematic um, poverty processes of decades ago that haunt us today, we'll continue to have these conversations. Did, did you feel helpless in a way? No, I, I don't want to give you that um, perception. Um, it just comes to a point where you, you recognize that um, there's very little you can do um, to address what's coming down the pike. Um, and you know, I, I had at one point considered leaving the department um, just before COVID, okay? Mm -hmm. um, I had some opportunities um, then, um, and, but I felt, I felt a certain kind of way mm -hmm. um, leaving that time um, because you gotta realize this, this is a police department I've been with, with 30, for 33 years and uh, there, there were some blind spots that I wanted desperately to address be, before exiting. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it, the, the challenges uh, became insurmountable. Uh, Norfolk is a uh, very dynamic city, right? And it calls for very dynamic individuals at certain times uh, to be in place, but it wears you out. Um, I cannot tell you, you go to bed, you go to bed. I go to bed, I wake up 30 minutes later through the night because of um, whatever the case may be. There's always something going on and it just wears you out. The vacancies that you talk about, uh, what are some of the causes of that? I mean, we, we see where COVID has caused so many things. I know there's a George Floyd. Um, morale, how would you describe why are there so many vacancies? Why are officers saying, I've had enough? Well, you, you, you captured it perfectly, you know. Um, so for us, for Norfolk, uh, vacancies uh, became a problem early 2019. Um, largely, largely due to pay, okay? So recognizing that I started having one-on-one -on -one conversations where the officers and professional staff members, uh, non-sworn, for 30 minutes each. And uh, the topics were pay, okay, and, and manpower. And my goal in having those conversations was to get an idea what the officers wanted so that I could, could take this information back uh, to city council. So while we're working through that, the pay issue, the pandemic hits, okay? And shortly after the pandemic, uh, you have the protests. Um, now, 
I've been around since 89, so I had the uh, opportunity to witness the events of Rodney King, the events of Ferguson, and, and those events reshaped uh, the profession, but not like the George Floyd um, event. Um, the, the, the community, okay, uh, saw, or the world saw what some of the community had been complaining about for decades, a very slow and casual murder at the hands of law enforcement. That really impacted a lot of folks because a lot of folks were home, right, because of COVID and folks saw this over and over and over again. It was very difficult to look at. And as a result, you had folks in the street. So for me, you know, I was looking at the news one night and I saw where Minneapolis Police Department, one of their precincts, had burnt down. The, the protesters went there and burnt down the, the precinct. Well, the next day there was a protest planned and the idea was to go to one of our precincts. Now, up until this time, I had never attended any of the protests because they've been, you know, quite frankly, they've been quite peacefully. But I went to this one only because I heard that they were going to destroy the precinct. Um, I, can, I can tell you um, when I joined the protest, it, it was from a position of um, keep the, the officers safe so that they wouldn't have to go hands-on with um, certain protesters. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it, it was from a position of keeping the folks safe inside that precinct, dispatchers, officers, as well as the protesters. And lastly, um, giving the folks an opportunity to voice their grievances absent of destroying our city. And all those goals were met. But the problem with that was it became um, such a distraction internally, the fact that I joined the protests internally, locally, stateside, nationally. And you have some officers uh, resign then because they thought I was picking sides. Then again, then on top of that, there was a uh, discipline decision that myself and the city manager had to make that went national. Um, and you had officers leave because of that as well. So you got this, this perfect storm of all this stuff going on that started with pay and all these other things just you know exacerbated the pay issue. Mm -hmm. So more naturally, okay, morale was going to be impacted um, as it was here in Norfolk um, and elsewhere. Okay, so that was, that was the morale piece where some officers left and then you got sure. other issues. Wow, how hard is it to be a police officer right now? Oh, it's extremely difficult, you know, um, particularly in an urban city. Okay, and I, and I say that because most of our officers are conservative, um, but they have a real concern about going into certain neighborhoods where they're subject to be videotaped and they may have to take actions that's lawful, right? Mm -hmm. But it looks bad and they have a real concern that they may be um, second guessed charged or not just charged, seriously hurt. Um, you know, we are all for police reform, all right? When I say we, I'm talking to the police department here in Norfolk. The fact of the matter is a lot of the things the folks were asking for across the nation, we had already implemented years ago. Um, but there comes a point where you can overreach um, in this arena where it impacts um, the officer's well-being. And, and I think um, we are cautiously at that, that, that breaking point. 
does that have a lot to do with the uptick in crime? The uptick in crime, um, I don't know if you can attach officers' morale to the uptick in crime, because I'll tell you, because I know, these officers are going to go to the danger, okay? They are responding and doing the very best they can in limited numbers. Um, the uptick in crime is due to, uh, I said this before and I'll say it again, you know, the uh, large sell of guns and folks that are in the possession of these guns that shouldn't have them um, in addition to that, the, the poverty issue, you know. Um, there's a reason why areas that are poverty impacted have crime, all right? As opposed to places that aren't uh, poverty impacted, you know. It, it's, it's just a very difficult thing to uh, address. Uh, it's going to take some time. It, it's, it's a challenge. Yeah. Some of the re more recent incidents, a lot of people are obviously still talking about Sierra Jenkins and the two other uh, people who died during that shooting on Granby Street that day. What we've heard is that it had something to do with the spill drink and argument in, the, in that club there. Sure. Shows. sure. Is there, what can you tell us about that? What, what can you tell us about that case that maybe we don't know? Uh, I'm not at liberty to speak about that case. What I've said already is as much as I can say. Okay. All right. I mean, do you think they're close to an arrest? So when I, before I retired, the, 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 the last bit of information that I had received was that they were in the process of having video reviewed from different locations surrounding the incident mm -hmm. and, and I don't know what came out of that. Okay. Hmm. And then uh, the situation at MacArthur is still, you know, you know who did that, you just, the guy is still at large. Yeah, so you know that, that situation, having seen um, the video, it, it just strikes at what's going on with some of our young men. This, this suspect, you know, uh, turned and opened fire on someone for relatively nothing and didn't have any regard for the backdrop, who's beyond this individual he was shooting at. It was that quick. And it didn't matter it was inside a mall with policemen there. Didn't matter, policemen were outside. That's the challenge, uh, Janet. How do, how do you fix that mindset? It's, an <laughs> it's, it's, it's scary. How do you fix that mindset when someone has no regard for the sanctity of life, when they will pull a trigger in close proximity of multiple people in the presence of law enforcement? And that's not just an anomaly. You guys are starting to see these videos almost every day where somebody's opening fire and taking off running. <laughs> they, mm -hmm. it, it's scary. Yeah, and, it, and it's, it's more random now. It's more... Yes, absolutely. You know, we used to be able to anticipate where shootings w would occur in Norfolk. We have no clue now. It can be anywhere. Yes. What do you tell people? Because, you know, we go out and do these stories, and then you'll talk to people on the street, and they'll say, you know, this has got to change. We have to do something. So average citizens here, and certainly people who are affected, loved ones, friends, they really feel helpless right now. So they're thinking, we've got to do something. What do you tell people like that? You know, <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, you know, I really don't know. Um, I, I wish I had the answer. If I had that answer, I wouldn't have chose to retire <laughs> because I feel as though this country, when you think about what has happened in the last several years, 
what happened as recently as uh, Sunday, Buffalo. Um, I don't know. We are at uh, the crossroads where we're going to have to make some hard decisions because, as you know, it's, it's not going to stop. And I don't know what those hard decisions look like. I'm not saying take away anybody's gun. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying, something that um, we typically do not do as law enforcement, okay? Because I believe that's where the fix is for the most part. It's hard to fix behavior, okay? That's, that's not a quick fix. But if there's policies in place um, to impact, the flow of illegal guns. In law enforcement, we typically deal with the end user, meaning the person we find the gun on. We never really deal with where the source of the gun came from. Mm -hmm. Because I can tell you as I sit here, uh, straw purchasing, um, which you know is illegal, is, is alive and well. And I think if you buy a gun, you give or sell that gun, you need to register, or that person that received said gun, need to register uh, that they received or bought the gun, and so on, and so on, and so on, just like a car. Yeah. Because you'll change behavior that way. That seems like a simple thing to do. It seems like it, but it's a one of those tough decisions. What would you say was your biggest accomplishment as chief? Well, I would say, first of all, I didn't achieve anything by myself. I had a dynamite staff, uh, the women and men of the North Police Department, and there's just too many things to mention. Uh, we were rocking and rolling for a, a little while, and I'm not just talking about the lip sync video either. I'm talking about a multitude of things that we were able to do in the arena of uh, crime prevention, leadership, uh, community outreach, um, we became the incubator of community outreach. Uh, a whole other host of other things that, that we were the first in the state or in the nation um, to do some things. Um, you know, um, if I had to wrap it in, in a nutshell, I, I, I would, I would uh, embrace the fact that we were very progressive. Um, and, and in urban cities, um, they need progressive police departments, um, particularly now. And as I said previously, there's no going back to whatever it was that we did 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, the community demands um, transparency. Absolutely. Yeah. Ab and, and, and deserves it. Uh, next step, well, so what are, you, what are you getting ready to do? Well, I'm getting ready to... Uh, you know, there's, I've developed an appetite for chilling. You know, <laughs> nothing wrong with that. <laughs> you know, I don't have to work. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm still a relatively young man, so I'm blessed in that regard. But I'm not the type to to flat back all day, right? Mm -hmm. So I'll explore opportunities as they arrive, and whatever feels right, that's a good fit for me. Mm -hmm. um, I'll you know, take a chance. Consulting maybe? Or? Well, I've already do that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. I, I was doing that um, as a chief. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, we'll okay. see. Okay.